Whoops. All the Living and the Dead by Haley Campbell. I read a good amount of it. I will say that. Um, I would love to hear your opinion on it. I think the overall book club rating score was pretty high. Don't mind me with my 70,000 tabs open. Oh, it's not that one either. Pink monkey. <laughs> That's where I was last. Meetings. Take your time. Take your time, Safari. I think it was pretty high. 8.08, .08, which is pretty high for the book club. Yeah. So everybody liked it. General consensus was everybody liked it. So I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Tell me overall thoughts of the book, writing. Would you read something else from this author, favorite chapter, et cetera, et cetera. Give me your spiel. Who would like to go first? Rating too. We like rating. Yes, Haley. I'll go ahead. So I really liked this book. Like I would give it like 10 out of 10. Um, it was one where I would read it in a lot of sittings during work. If I would have a no show with a client, I would just, cause I had the ebook. So I would just pull it up on my phone. I was flying through this one pretty quickly, very heavy. I will say that, but very, very interesting. Um, I believe in one of the chapters, she mentioned the crime scene cleanup who had an Instagram account. And I was like, oh, let me go check out that Instagram account. Um, I only had it like, because they have to approve for you to follow them. They don't have it just like out there. Um, so I had like two or three of the images pop up on my feed. And I was like, mm, this is a little too much for me. You're going through like, seeing pictures of your friends and <laughs> drinks and food. And then next thing you're like, oh, there's just a puddle of blood on the floor. So that was a little much, but the writing was very compelling. Um, just hearing about all these jobs that we don't really think about in our day to day, but right. death is a part of life. And there's people out there who need to take care of the parts that we kind of shut out. So it was really interesting to see that perspective of how the people in those types of fields process it and work through it right. and hearing their stories. Yeah. Yeah. I freaked out my boyfriend recently because he sent me a video on TikTok of a crime scene cleanup. And I was like, oh yeah, Spalding Decon down in Florida mm -hmm. or something like that. And he was like... <laughs> you know the name of this company and I'm like yeah I've been following their YouTube for years um sure that's pretty alarming um something else kind of, you mentioned Instagram too which is something happened recently that just felt extremely jarring um was I I for work I produce podcasts and I'm logged into this the account of one of the podcasts that I produce and I was just going to check their dms i kind of monitor those things make sure nobody's acting crazy because it happens and the first picture that showed up was a picture of one of the girls i don't know why they just don't follow a lot of people so i'm, I'm guessing this is why but it was one of the girls that was murdered in idaho it was not saying no, but it was one of the other girls it's just like a instagram post and it was like the most jarring thing because I was like oh my god like it's it's just it made it very um scarily real I don't know why that showed up on the feed because it was an old picture too and I just I don't I don't understand um anyway I I really respect crime scene cleaners I mean like mm -hmm. to an extent where it's just like I there's something she said in this book too where you know there people in the death industry are kind of like the unsung heroes, um, especially when it came to like the pandemic and stuff like that. And I'm sure we'll talk about that too later on. Um, Michelle. Did I unmute myself? Hello. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so this, I liked how she tied everything together, how she was able to highlight so many different industries 
And it was just kind of really seamless. I really enjoyed that. I work in one of the death industries. I've attended an autopsy. I solved homicides. And so it was interesting to see an outside perspective kind of coming and learning about that, I guess. Um, I also found it really interesting to see the differences in like other countries. She mentioned that like, I think it was 80% of the dead bodies were cremated in the UK versus here. It's a lot less. And so that was really interesting too. But she's spot on with autopsies and you you never forget the smell. Mm. Yeah. I considered going into the mortuary business, but I don't know if I could do it. I might. I don't know if I could though. Um, and that's awesome. I did not know you worked in that. Did I call you a nurse last meeting? Were you here last meeting? And I was yes. like, <laughs> maybe that's what yeah. I was thinking. <laughs> it was no, like, I'm a, wrong Michelle. No, maybe that's actually what a detective at a police department. So I've thankfully oh. not had to uh, attend a baby autopsy, but I've certainly seen dead children and it's not not great. So yeah. I get where she was continually traumatized by that for sure. Man. Mm. Yeah. I, in theory, I think I could do it, but at the same time, I don't know. I, I may not be able to. So thank you. Thank you for that. That's, you really do incredible work. Amber. Hello. And Pikachu. <laughs> <laughs> They were saying it was like meanwhile, like what was it when they talked to the actual like like the crime scene cleaner guy? Like first, I'm trying to find. I was like literally like I was like reading and I'm like, wait, is this the Instagram dude? <laughs> is it? And, oh my god, it is the Instagram dude. <laughs> I've followed him for years, and so I was like, I'm trying to see where. I think is this him? I think this where's eighty five. 85 is his chapter. I do wish the chapter headings had like the title. Yeah, they're called just like the horror, but I wanted it to say like the horror crimes yeah. cleaning, but that's yeah. just a nitpicky thing. Let's see if see if this will work. Because like like if you see it's like literally I was like, wait, <laughs> is this the IG do? <laughs> and then like the next, and then literally like a few paragraphs later, it is. It is. <laughs> I didn't realize that shit it's like and there was the same like I kind of really liked it because like at one point he talks about like he actually like clarifies what he means by when I think he always talks he would always talk, put um what is it it's the p the hashtag p for d on his post and I was always just like what does that mean like I don't know I don't know and he actually defines it in this chapter she asked him about it, and it's like it's I guess it's uh pray for death wow um, this means death equals cash. Murder is his business too. Oh God. <laughs> but I saw that. I was just like, oh, so that like, it was kind of like that. Oh, so that's what that means. That's kind of like, At but, least um, honest. but yeah, like reading that, his chapter, I'm like, oh, yeah, like I can kind of like see like she's talking about how he's like this, like has like this, like very cold, almost like cold, like personality with like no emotion I'm like and you can kind of see that like when you go scroll through like his captions and responses you're like you can see how they, those two things correlate between the two um because it's one of those things like you read some of those captions and you're like is he is he as like you know as like cold and unfeeling as he seems in some of these captions or is he just doing that because yeah and so I was like but um yeah, it's like I really enjoyed the book. I some of the some of the things I skipped over, like a couple I skipped over because it didn't interest me, and then a couple others like I just couldn't read them. Yeah, like I think it was who was it? It was um the anatomical pathology technologist in the bereavement woodwife. Those two, I'm just like, mm, nope, can't can't do that. Like I tried reading that, and I was like, mm, no, nope, we're just gonna. Yeah skip right over that like because i'm like i can't do that um just because like maybe that is part of it for me is like you know like having been somebody like my grandma had was just recently passed away so like the cremation guy was kind of interesting because she was cremated so i'm like 
no like it's a, it was kind of weird like reading that one because I'm like okay so this is what happened to my grandma like a year and a half ago all right yeah um, and then also having been somebody who's had to like kind of help try and keep somebody alive because they tried committing suicide like that was like when we got to the APT I'm like yeah no this is making me think of all that I mm, nope mm, we're just I'm like and look now on my goodreads it says that I've read a big chunk of this book (laughs) well do they (laughs) do they explain the process because I'm very fortunate enough to not have have dealt with this just yet but like do they explain kind of the process to you with uh cremation or do they just kind of like yeah we're gonna put her in kind of my grandma like they may have explained it to my uncle or my dad right because she lived her and my uncle live in Watkins Glen and um she had been living in um basically like long-term care in like a local the nearby hospital ever since just before the um panini started because she had had a few like a year or so previous she'd been diagnosed with um alzheimer's Mm -hmm. and my uncle is not exactly great at taking care of himself so and he was but he and but that was like his best friend he had in his head i'm gonna take care of her i'm gonna do all this i'm gonna do all this and we're like no like you can't like and so she got we ended up she broke her hip at one point so that's when she got put into the long-term care Mm -hmm. and I think she had like a stroke on top of everything and that was kind of where she was just like she was able to see my dad and my uncle like right before that happened coincidentally and she was able to like kind of find out that like everything was good because this was like the first time my dad had been able to see her since before the pandemic and so he got to find out okay my my you know my son who moved out of our town he's doing good his family's doing good my my only granddaughter's doing good i've managed to help my and like my other son who's like the very he was like the very clingy one she's like all right i've been able to do that and then she kind of just i think let herself finally go she's like all right like every everybody i love and that's still alive is taken care of yeah so now i don't have to sit here and like worry because literally my 4th of July weekend, my dad went down there and her, my, my uncle and him saw her. And by the end of that week, she passed away. Wow. And her, and she had wanted to be cremated because for her, she was 95. And in her will, she's like, there's nobody left except my family that's alive that I, I cared about. She's like, because my grandpa had passed away when I was 14 and he was also cremated and then so she wanted to be cremated and have her ashes scattered off the same little like cottage pier that his had been scattered off of like almost 20 years ago yeah because they had been married for 50 years before he passed away um so yeah it's like they may have described the process to either my uncle or my dad because yeah I, I think I don't um and my uncle is He's a, he's, he's, he's one of those people, like, he doesn't, he, I'm, like, he, he doesn't sometimes understand everything. Sure. And I think that's due to the part that he's one of the, like, he went from being somebody who ran marathons when I was, like, a kid, to now he has type 2 diabetes, a pacemaker, and a defibrillator. Mm-hmm. Don't know what caused that, but, like, so, like, and I think a lot of that, like, has affected him but like he for him it was like he lived in the same apartment complex as my grandma he saw her every single day like yeah. that was his best friend oh, and so man. he may they may have explained him but with trauma and grief he may have not ever actually you never compared heard any of it and then we went yeah and scattered her ashes I think I don't know when she was cremated um because but she passed in like july uh, let's see we are in 20 we just had in july 2021 and we went down to Watkins Glen to scatter her ashes in october 2021 um but like but for me it was the one thing i found interesting is like when they're explaining it they say that like they give you an urn i was like rude we got a box <laughs> we got literally I thought you a picked that out box. i thought that was like part of the funeral home where you walked in and like selected what you wanted your ashes to be in that's so yeah well at first they give you a box and then you have to pay for the expensive urn 
I think, I, you know, very again, fortunately, haven't had to deal with that yet. Possibly soon, but hopefully yeah, not. Straight up, give it to you in an urn. And I was like, rude. <laughs> Cars came in a cardboard box with a plastic bag. Somebody's <laughs> used Vans shoe box that they just had lying around. <laughs> They put it in like a plat, like all the ashes were just in like a plat, normal plat, like little like plastic bag that we had to open up and then it seal inside like a cardboard box. So I was reading, I'm like, y'all get urns in these? <laughs> like, I have to go buy my own. <laughs> like, so I was the one who was in like the stuff we have, like any of us have our her ashes and our urns, but like that was like ended up being like my set part of the process. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I know because like I remember oh everybody's gonna want ashes like we're not gonna because like we're not I'm like we're not gonna scatter all of it I know I want some I'm like and I know both her sons are gonna want some even though my dad at first was like no I don't want I'm like no you're gonna want some even if it's just a little like that's yeah. your mom like Take a piece gonna of. want some so he's like okay fine so it's like my job to go find everybody like little tiny like sealable containers to keep their to keep their different bits of ashes in <laughs> for the amount of, so like, of grandma <laughs> <laughs> like you get the arm yeah you right. get the shoulder. I wish there was a way to differentiate it like I want mom's arm I'm also really fascinated too by the process they now have where they can like essentially skin you um and right. preserve your tattoos and I'm like hmm I kind of want that <laughs> something kind like, of interesting <laughs> about that ashes do they don't feel how you think they're gonna feel like I was like they're a very weird feeling mm -hmm. what they are like it's almost like like you know it's ash but it's almost like you're picking up like the it feels like you're picking up the finest of sand but it's got like the ashy consistency right like sticks because like Ooh, that's so if you get the dust that comes yeah. with it it's a very process scattering one's ashes if you're doing it in like chunks we've all seen like, those we videos too where they toss it and the wind's blowing at them and yeah. it's like, like, like although at one point it was awkward because like obviously like my grandparents don't own this little cottage that the dock was attached and like the, the people who own it now are up they're like who are you what are you doing here and i'm like me being me and like just like the current state I was in I was like my grandma's only granddaughter I'm like we're here to scratch my dead grandma's ashes okay <laughs> let us be I think it's illegal to do that in certain places though, like Disney I think you need to have like a special permission or it might even be completely illegal yeah so yeah. I was just I remember being was like excuse me <laughs> you're a lot of I'll fight you <laughs> Ashley had your hand raised Thank you for coming by the way so good to see you yeah i'm excited i'm like it's my first time here I'm, this book was amazing um this was like the perfect way to start off my year it was part of my news resolution to read more nonfiction, and i was like perfect ways to by joining this because it's actually something i'm interested in instead of trying to like force myself into reading something i'm like eh about yeah. Um, this book was amazing. I think it touched on a lot of things that I really have always been curious about or wanted to read about. Um, it read very similarly to uh, From Here to Eternity, which I think you guys read last year, um, which I've read before. And I love that it's like bite-sized peaks at different communities and different experiences that people had. Um, I think a few of us kind of hit a rough patch with the um, baby part of this. Uh, it was a little rough. I definitely had to take a break after yeah. that. I was like, Ooh, okay, I wanted to <laughs> trudge through it and kind of like part of reading these things and part of, you know, exposing yourself to it. I feel like it's part of the experience. Like it's supposed to be uncomfortable. It's why we're reading about it. It's why she's writing about it mm -hmm. and I kind of trudged through it to feel uncomfortable and to feel those feelings and I've had friends who have experienced losing a child and things like that so I wanted to have a piece that at least could see what that experience looked like even if it was horrifying yeah. um 
and I really identified a lot with the bereavement midwife in wanting to create change where she could, even if she felt like she couldn't actually change anything, but she could change the experience or be part of alleviating some of the trauma or the stress of being in this life altering traumatic life event, um, which I loved. And it's part of like what I try to do in, in a small way in my life and in my career in trying to help make life things easier or at least lessen some of that weight where wherever I can, even if I don't have control over their actual situation. Right. Um, but I love the writing, would totally read something like this again. I really loved it. No, I'm so glad. Yeah, the, I mean, we saw that Caitlin Dowdy was blurbed on the front. So I assumed the writing may be similar. And I do think these two books, uh, From Here to Eternity, which was voted on from the book club members as their favorite read of last year for the book club. It's, um, I mean, I love Caitlin Dowdy, but this definitely felt like kind of another Caitlin, not to like, you know, minimize Haley Campbell's work and like overshadow her with Caitlin Dowdy, um, who was very successful, but this just, this felt like such a good pairing to it. And it felt like another Caitlin Dowdy book that I've been kind of itching for for the past however long it's been since I've read a Caitlin Dowdy book so yeah this was this was great I completely agree um Val hi Val you are muted if you would like to <laughs> but this is like the first time actually reading a book like fully reading it um <laughs> I enjoyed it. I am actually like, I work at a funeral home. So oh, seeing yeah. things like that, it was like, it was nice to have someone from the outside, kind of like Michelle mentioned, someone from the outside looking in and just being able to like, kind of like where she mentioned that, um, I think it was the embalmer or maybe the um, autopsy tech that mentioned like, we do these things, like things that families wouldn't really know, but something that like, like with putting each other's faces that kind of thing like the family would never know that mm -hmm. but there's things here and there where like me personally it's like I wouldn't want this done to like my parents like sometimes we'll get families that just don't bring underwear don't bring like things like that it's like I think they'd be a little bit more comfy with underwear on underneath that like so they're not just so it's little things like that where it was nice to see that she put that into there right and seeing the other aspects of other things like I've dealt with the coroners, so there's a little bit here and there where, like, we know some details here and there, but actually, you know, hearing the full thing about what they do, as well as the crime scene cleaner um, and the bereavement midwife, unfortunately, I've done, like, services for not only elderly, but also children, so seeing the first part of it also and having her interview that was really nice, um, this was, like, I really, I really like this book. <laughs> Oh God. It's so fascinating. I was hoping too, that this would happen, that there would be people in the industry who have read this and were able to contribute to the book club too, because I would love to hear that perspective. Um, but I mean, thank you again for everything that you do. It's, it's such a difficult, but necessary. I don't want to use the word rewarding, but it is just such a necessary industry. Um, so that's, that's amazing. And I might have to message you later about mortuary school because I've considered it for a very long time um yeah it's kind of tough I'll say that um yeah. I've had people that are like you know what I got a bachelor's in this and this is a lot harder than my bachelor's um here in California it's like an associate's degree um I personally was part of it but then didn't continue on and finish it because it's not really what I was focused on like I didn't want to become an embalmer um but it's person that I really like mortuary school <laughs> so yeah. I mean I would always like it's really cool just dependent every kind every kind of state every school is a little different but right. it's very it's a very rewarding job I know it's kind of weird to say it's like a very missed job um I get family sometimes like you're way too young to be in this industry like you look really young why are you part of this but like someone has to do it <laughs> yeah right um <laughs> thanks um, yeah, I thought, I mean, I thought too, kind of speaking on that as well, that this was a really interesting way to start the book too, talking about how, um, 
I think it was the just the very first chapter of the embalmer where it's yeah the first dead body you see should not be someone you love which I thought was super fascinating um and that kind of perspective on it because it makes sense it kind of makes mm-hmm. sense um and I I've always been I've I've always been really fascinated by this um something is happening on TikTok where just like a bunch of random guys are asking me how I'm doing. <laughs> um anyway. Uh Becky. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, oh, hi. Welcome. Thanks. Um I also I just finished it this afternoon. I also really enjoyed it. Um I gave it a five out of five. Um I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> Um, similar to what Ashley said, the the baby part was really difficult, but <sighs> my kid is screaming. Um, anyway, whatever, ignore. Um, I found that whole mid uh, bereavement midwife interesting. Like, I don't think we have that here in America. I've never heard of that before. Um, but like how important like what an important job and what an important like need being yeah. filled right like we don't want to face these things but they're a reality for people and um like Ashley was saying having someone who takes such care to try to make like the worst thing that ever happens to somebody like to treat them with gentleness yeah um I think is just like just like so beautiful <laughs> right and um that's the part about the book that I think was the most like touching to me was the love and care and like tenderness that a lot of these people like do every day in their job the crime scene guy kind of really turned me off I I don't follow that account and I won't like I can read about stuff, but I don't necessarily want to like see it. I'm definitely not like, I listen to lots of true crime, but I'm definitely not the person who goes and looks up crime scene photos. It's okay. If you are the person who does that, that's just not for me. But, um, I also found the executioner's, uh, chapter really interesting and just kind of how far he, um, distanced himself from, you know, like it's basically like, he said something about how, like, it's basically suicide. (laughs) <laughs> because they did it to themselves because of their actions and I just thought that was such an interesting perspective not in a judgmental way so much but just um I have my own feelings I guess about capital punishment and yeah. don't really agree with it so I just thought that that was an interesting um like I said perspective that it's like well they did it to themselves so it's suicide or whatever I'm like mm, I hmm, I'm not sure about that hmm. um so <laughs> I found, like I said, I kind of just found, and she also writes very beautifully, but I think one of the things that she came to understand as she was going through this process was, like I say, the sort of like tenderness that's involved in um, when you're in this industry and not only towards the person who used to be, you know, alive and and, um, taking them to their final, you know, destination, but also just the families and everybody's who's who's impacted. Um, I also got really emotional at the very end and I don't mean to spoil it for anybody, but she has like an afterword Mm -hmm. and she basically says some, she's kind of talks about the pandemic because she was like finishing this book, um, you know, during the midst of the pandemic and basically saying how like we're all survivors of this era defined by death. And Mm -hmm. that like kind (laughs) of, heavy getting a little emotional even just talking about it because I hadn't really thought of it that way like even though we have talked about and I do feel that we've all kind of gone through a collective trauma with the pandemic whether you lost someone or you didn't just sort of the magnitude of human life lost um but the way she just kind of framed it was just really like yeah it hits you like Mm -hmm. right in the chest you know, and, um, and then one last thing, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, He he doesn't, not anymore. I actually called my dad this afternoon also, because um, he's been retired for a number of years, but in his retirement, one of his 
um, jobs was he was working at a local cemetery in my hometown. Wow. Um, and so the, the grave digger um, chapter I found really poignant and I hadn't really asked him very much about, about his work. And um, so we just kind of had a little discussion and I'm from Wisconsin. So the part about um, like, they can't, you can't bury anyone in the winter. Right. Um, and asking him about the little like mechanism they use to like melt the ground if they really need to bury somebody in the winter time and stuff was so it was just sort of like I didn't expect to like think about my dad in the book and then I was like oh yeah like I guess my dad has kind of been in this industry and I just didn't even really think about that like yeah. it, I didn't like think about it in that way um but he he did find it rewarding um you know so he was you know more of a groundskeeper I guess but um yeah so and then the other thing that I think this really brought forth for me was um <sighs> being prepared when my time comes and like like you know you can you can plan your funeral like you can pay for your funeral now and then no one is burdened with it and stuff like that so I feel like when books like this always make me think about okay like what do I want and and how can I make it easier for people in my life that would be left behind and um my grandparents were the same way their funerals were like paid off like 10 years before they even uh passed away and stuff and so I think when you can take the take that part of it out for people and they can maybe some people want that to focus on because everybody grieves differently but there's something to be um not having to put that those kind of like practical things on people and when it's all spelled out then they can just make sure they're honoring your wishes and they can carry on how they need to um with the loss so anyways i loved it um i haven't read any caitlin dowdy um she thanks her in her um like acknowledgments at the end so they've obviously spoken and talked if they're not already if they're not friends um so i didn't I didn't expect it to impact me as much as it did, I guess. Um, but, but it was, you know, a pleasant surprise, I guess. So I think it's just, I think it's an important book. I think it's important for people to know about these kinds of things. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, my, my no, God. you're fine. I love it. I also, I also work for Boeing, um, which has been, um, difficult in the last several years um, with the plane crashes that we've had um, and things like that. It's been um, truly uh, devastating for people who work there, of course, as well as the families who lost lives. Um, and so the chapter about like the disaster, like the disaster people who come in, I had never really thought about that part of it either. Like from my interesting, my standpoint in the industry, we just think of like the NSTB and like the investigation and like how do we what happened and how can we prevent it from happening again and you don't you don't think about the practicalities of having to go and find remains and things like that so that was a really impactful chapter for me as well and i so i guess my point is we don't maybe some of us maybe don't think about this stuff a lot maybe on this call a lot of us do because we're here but that's what I mean by the book is so important because it really makes you think about how this touches all of us and there's all this stuff going on all the time and we're just it's just sort of invisible to us and maybe it shouldn't be and to your point uh patches about them being kind of unsung heroes and stuff they're sort of like the silent like frontline workers yeah. right who it's like we give a and rightly so we give a lot of attention to people who save lives and bring lives into the world and things like that and and there should probably be equal praise bestowed on those who like I say take us you know at the end of our lives so absolutely I think that's it enough for now <laughs> no, no, no you're good I was literally I was I had like so many things to say on top of what you were saying so I was like don't okay, scribbling notes um no, I so really like, enjoyed the book 
the COVID stuff was heavy was too. Very wonderful. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm I'm oh I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's what I was saying. I was so excited because nothing is more of a bummer whenever we all kind of collectively vote to read a book and it sucks. Like, yeah, that does suck. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the worst feeling. Like, <laughs> oh man. Um yeah. actually I don't know. I don't I won't tell you who. Well, she's not here and I, I didn't get permission to tell this story. So I, I will be very gentle with it. But there was a book that we did read fairly well it was last year um, I want to say fairly recently but it was last year where it was kind of collectively just meh um, we had some issues with it and she posted a TikTok about her issues with it and um the author commented like a million times about, oh god uh, his friends <laughs> and she sent me the screenshots and I felt fucking terrible I was like so sorry like I, I somehow like was feeling like I was part of the blame you know like anyway that's a different topic I'll let her tell that story if she that's, wants to. that's a, that's the author's problem not your problem. I know but I just I we picked the book I get it. It was, oh, like, I just felt so bad um no the uh <laughs> the COVID stuff was really fascinating to me and there's a couple books that I've been meaning to read I'm just when it comes to COVID you clearly get one of two sides with it so when it comes to reading books or there's I don't even want to say two I feel like there's 50 different ways you can split up COVID and people's opinions on it so I'm very wary about which books I pick up about COVID but um I think it was a time where people were kind of seeing death for the first time and like having to deal with death and funeral directors and suddenly like you know all these you know people affected by it when they didn't even think like I should start planning for mom at, you know, this certain age. And it's just like, this wasn't supposed to happen yet, you know? And there was actually a really fascinating part, the end of the foreword, which also I love that you mentioned, she thanked Caitlin Dowdy in the like acknowledgements. I love when a book is so good that you read all the way through it like that <laughs> when you continue through the acknowledgements. It's like, you know, like, yeah, I want to read every last word. Um, so this was, this was really fascinating. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing but yeah the afterward was heavy and heavily covid based um talking about just how how many bodies there were at this point 650 bodies on the brooklyn waterfront belonging to families who either could not be located or could not afford a burial because the funeral industry is very expensive mm -hmm. at the very bottom here she says back in late march 2020 standing in the rose garden hundreds of thousands of deaths ago which, mm -hmm. wow President Donald Trump said, I wish we could have our old life back. We had the greatest economy that we've ever had, and we didn't have death. She goes on to say, we've always had death. We've just avoided its gaze. We hide it so we can forget it, so we can go on believing it won't happen to us. But during the pandemic, death felt closer and possible and everywhere to everyone. We are the survivors of an era defined by death, which is what you're saying. We will have to move the furniture of our minds. There goes the heat. I'm yelling. <laughs> we'll have to move the furniture of our minds to accommodate this newly visible guest, which I was like, oh my God. I, I didn't finish like a couple of the chapters, but I did went ahead and like read the after. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to make well, sure and I that, get the part. that Trump quote pissed me off even all over again, too. And um, I don't, you know, whatever. I mean, <laughs> what a dismissive quote when yeah. he, there, all of the deaths that were preventable and for him to say that is just disgusting to me yeah. she framed it you know she she didn't go there and and i and i get it and appreciate that but yeah right it just kind of it kind of stirred some stuff up in me again of like just fuck you man yeah. like <laughs> you know um and 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 i think that's the other another part of like the of um the death that we'll have to deal that we'll have to grapple with as a nation right is not all of those people had to die yeah so. and i'm sure funeral directors everywhere too were saying the same thing about that quote where it's like are you kidding me like and just because it's death in a different way that maybe we haven't seen pandemic style right mean that like this hasn't been happening and yeah i i thought also what you were saying too Something I did want to bring up and ask was um, if you're okay with sharing Becky, you could say no, but um, having, if I had a family member that worked in a cemetery, I would annoy the hell out of them and I wouldn't show up. <laughs> but did your family, I guess, have like a different sort of perspective on death, having somebody work in that type of industry? Because I feel like sometimes families are very like my family. I mean, especially is very closed off. We don't really talk about, we don't really talk about death, which is really interesting. Yeah. The only 
started working there post-retirement. So it was short term. And I remember even myself being kind of like, hmm, uh, okay. Um, but the way my dad talks about it, I, I think even for him, he kind of gained some like newfound respect for, for that. Right. And, um, seeing, and he even said it today, you know, he's like, he said he misses it and he doesn't miss it. Um, you know, <laughs> he's like, I don't mean this to sound like a pun, but he said something about like, you know, just having real, some really kind of poignant, quiet moments, you know, in a cemetery is pretty quiet, you know, and just kind of having time to reflect and, you know, some of his own friends, um, are laid to rest there and oh, wow. being able to, um, visit them and, you know, kind of, like I say, just sort of have, um, reflective times, you know, as he was working there. Cause he, he, he also just worked, you work alone a lot. I think, you know, if you're just mowing the, if you're just mowing or whatever, you're kind of by yourself. Um, so, um, I'm sure some other people, maybe like in my extended family, maybe kind of side-eyed it. And I grew up in a very like Catholic family. So that, um, that might have a factor in it as well. Yeah. And so like you know, my, I think my dad's viewpoints have shifted also from like, you know, like he doesn't want to be buried anymore. He, he would like to be cremated and, um, things like that. So, um, yeah. I, I think it's, Sorry, I, I put you on the spot. Of, I was just so curious. You know, I, like I said, I think even for myself, I kind of was like, that's kind of weird, like yeah. at first, but, um, but when you, when you really think about it, like it's necessary. Yeah. Right. Somebody said it earlier, someone has to do it. And I would rather, it would be someone like my dad <laughs> who oh, is that. kind, who yeah. is kind and respectful and, um, really understood the importance of his job that mm. that is doing it you know what I mean yeah no I, I love that I kind of got chills when you said that um oh <laughs> it's, it's so funny my um my dad is petrified of hospitals and death and decay and anything like that so he gets kind of freaked out when I talk about my book club and wear my shirt because he's like oh god <laughs> like he doesn't really like it it's so funny um also, I love, I didn't even realize Lindsay Fitzharris is quoted on the back here too. We just read her, uh, her book last month. We discussed her book. Um, and also something you mentioned too, which is something I wanted to bring up. I think there's been like this shift tonally almost when it comes to writing about these kind of things. And we see it in books by Amanda Montell, who did Cultish and um, Mary Roach, I think. There's been a couple books out there that have almost this quirkiness in their writing. Hello, little person. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it, there's almost this, what's the word? Like a flippant way almost of like their writing that turns a lot of people off. But I felt like Haley Campbell just accomplished this tone so well in her writing where it wasn't like, she discusses some of these people obviously working in this industry, having to have some sort of like, you know, um, attitude where they have to remind themselves like these are just meat suits like they're not people like they have to kind of make jokes and they kind of have you know because it's just going to be death and decay around you all the time might as well you know talk about how quiet the cemetery is or something like that you know what I mean so but it's interesting too because I, I think that her writing is much more approachable than maybe a Mary Roach or sometimes even Caitlin Dowdy. Caitlin Dowdy has these like jokes here and there that may turn some people off because it's like a serious topic and like yes I get that but I think tonally this was one of the best ways you could talk about death in my opinion um I, yeah, again very very well done and I um I love I loved it um and I, I love that you loved it um um one last thing sorry I like it too I just found out that a co-worker of mine's dad is an FBI agent I have a list of questions I lost my shit when I found this out yeah. <laughs> like six like I'm like you know one person away from knowing someone in the FBI this is amazing and um he was very gracious <laughs> with my little freak out, but similarly, like talking about the jokes and like, you know, to seeing like how his dad, like they have to use humor to deal with what they're dealing with. Um, 
because he he I think worked in like child pornography so like the worst of the freaking worst yeah six degrees of Kevin Bacon but it's the FBI that's exactly right so anyways I yeah I don't I don't judge the humor because I get why but yeah there's sometimes I think that might be a little bit why the crime scene guy turned me off a little bit because he, he didn't he didn't come off the same way as some of the other right people and oh, that's God. just maybe the way he has to deal with it like I don't want to say he's a callous person or anything like that but it just came off differently that I was like okay <laughs> the callousness can sometimes yeah be like I understand that this may help you but the way that you're like coming off is a little rude also Michelle I have so many questions Michelle you work in like autopsies and but your boyfriend also works with the FBI like what kind of dream relationship are you in right now this is incredible I love this <laughs> well we we both work for the police department but he does God. internet crimes against children and works with the FBI and then I do crimes against persons so we're both detectives I don't think I think the Aries would come out if I was working in those type of like I would become the most hateful and spiteful person if I was having to see shit like that every day like I feel like like just thinking about it and not even like having to see anything I don't think I'd be able to exist doing those types of jobs so I all the applause and yeah I I couldn't do his job at all at all I would I mean ooh, yeah I would get I would get yeah yeah again yeah please thank your boyfriend for all he does oh my god I would I would lose it. Thank you so much for hanging out, AJ. No worries. No worries. Um, we appreciate you here. So sorry. It's taken me for, <laughs> sorry, it's taken me so long to get to you, Carrie. Um, I just had so many questions written down because I'm, I'm so glad we love this book. But anyway, go ahead. Also, I think your hair was not purple last time. So if it wasn't, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I was afraid this book was going to be like stiff. Um, what, where like, it is like that goofy kind of like, tone and then just kind of that um Mary wrote narrow... this book stiff or what's well, yeah ca- yeah the roach oh, okay. just yeah. Sure. yeah 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 stiff um so I went into this afraid that I was going to be like stiff and I had just read stiff so I was like well here we go again like but um she the author of uh all living dead she just um explored such a wide range of people in the death industry things that I didn't even know existed like the bereavement midwives which they do exist in the mid in the um USA I looked it up they're called death midwives so yeah which is really cool on the dot yeah so um yeah things that I never knew or like oh my god that's right executioners technically do work in the death industry or they are are like a part of this like chain of death and things I've never thought about before so that was really refreshing Mm -hmm. um yeah I guess the chapters that stuck with stuck with me were definitely the bereavement midwife chapter um I was just blown away by the amount of care that those people showed to the mothers and the babies and everything like that um and the COVID chapter. So I echo a lot of what uh, Becky had said uh, and what everyone has said. Um, but yeah, those those chapters really stuck with me. Um, yeah, 10 out of 10. I, I love this book. It's It was really written in a very poetic way, which was so beautiful for this, um, for talking about death and, and it should be poetic. So um, it was so good yeah and it was one of those books that like I hugged after I read it because it was just so touching like ah, I'm done it's so good <laughs> that means um, so much yeah um so yeah um uh, just um really blown away with the breadth like the, the variety that she stuck in there and the chapters the ones that were like really off to me were like the um executioner that was I don't know why that chapter was just so fucking weird and she could not grasp this dude's point of view at all and I was like oh my god um, <laughs> and, and like the red lobster scene and all that I was like okay um, <laughs> and then the um the crime scene dude the crime scene cleanup dude um was kind of funny and she just had she met so many different characters from like people with PhDs to just 
dudes who dig graves. And I think that's so important to just include that wide variety of people. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, oh, I'm so glad. That makes me so happy. Yeah. Alex. Guys, there we go. This is my first time um, joining you guys. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is a little raspy. I'm getting sick. <laughs> no, but I, I love. Yeah, I um, I've been wanting to join for like a year since you started it. So here I am. <laughs> Welcome. What a good book to come in on, too. I love. I it. yeah, I loved it. It was so good. It was my first time reading something like this. And kind of like um, what everyone else said, I thought it was so beautifully written. Um, like she's talking about very like, you know, grotesque and like morbid things, but like, it was like, like, um, sorry, was it Carrie? Um, poetic is what she said. So it, yeah, it was beautiful. Um, back to the embalmers chapter, um, how the first dead body that you see should not be someone that you love. Um, I was introduced to death at a very young age. Uh, my father passed away when I was seven. Um, so it kind of like brought back a lot of memories that I kind of like forgot about. Um, like my mom picking out clothes to take for my dad to wear for his funeral. Wow. And um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. And um, I like, excuse me. I remember like the touch of him, like how stiff he was and he didn't feel like himself. <laughs> Uh, I'm so sorry I did that. No, you're fine. You're fine. You're totally we've we've had crying on your I, I think we're all hugging. You're welcome, you all, Alex. We are. It was like a million years ago. It's been what 20 almost 23 years ago now, but um yeah, I, I just remember like how he felt and I I mean, obviously I cried when this happened and at the funeral and stuff, but when I was like saying my final goodbye to him and like touching him, I don't, I didn't cry. I just was like, so like baffled by like, this is my father, but it's not my father. And then what really got me in the chapter was how they put little caps in their eyes because they're like sunken in. So I'm reading this and I'm like, oh my God. And I remember being a little kid and like, this is, I've never admitted this to anybody, but I remember after the funeral being like I want to go dig him up like I want to see what he looks like like I like I couldn't wrap my mind around it so um yeah it, it was a really good book like these are like I mean good tears like you know like things that I didn't remember um but then going to like the babies like so like as I was reading it like I was able to handle it like I don't know like it just it didn't like freak me out or anything. I just had like was had questions and like was remembering stuff. But about the babies, um, I'm now a mom of two little boys. So the baby stuff like hits home. Like I can't handle it. Me and my husband have always watched like true crime and like these documentaries and stuff. And I'm like, oh, like I love it. Right after having kids, I'm like, I can't handle the kids stuff. And um, so that was a little bit hard. And um, I think I tagged you, um patches on TikTok like I was scrolling TikTok and I saw a bereavement photographer in a hospital and that was the first time I'd yeah. seen something like that since reading this book and I'm like oh my god so crazy these babies are so beautiful but um I kind of regret tagging you in that now because I'm like I don't want that stuff to pop up because like I can't you know like, <laughs> algorithm. like I can't handle the babies but um you are fine I, I remember that now that was so incredible yeah and like to that. have that job like I, that would wear on me like those people like really are heroes I think for absolutely. being able to do that absolutely um so, yeah thank you so much for coming thank you so much for sharing Thanks your for story me. I'm, I'm sorry that I cried it was nice no, to this is a, you can, <laughs> listen we are a bunch of criers we get it no worries at all and like you're so you were so young I mean like how are you you know supposed to even if it was 20 30 40 70 years ago like that's just not something you just like okay, well, you know, get over, you know, that's going to sit with you for a while. Um, and that's please crazy. feel free to tag me in it. Don't mess up your algorithm, but I do <laughs> want to see stuff like that. So <laughs> please send it to me. I messed up my algorithm recently too, because there was a, a we were talking about Boeing. It's a plane crash recently. And I guess I watched the video for longer than a minute because now every other freaking video on my for you page is plane crashes. And I'm okay. like, okay. <laughs> Well, all right. This is this is my algorithm now. Um, and then 
poor Chris, he's now getting crime scene cleaning stuff on his page, which is my fault. So um, that makes sense. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here. I'm also obsessed with your wallpaper. I don't know what that is behind you, but I love thank it. You. I love you know, it. I, I forget where I got it, but um, I can tag you in it. <laughs> Once you find it, please tell me. I don't think I can put up wallpaper in here since, well, we'll see. One day. We'll see. It actually was pretty easy. And me and my husband did not fight, so... <laughs> I feel like that's a pretty good <laughs> testament to how easy it was. Good, good to know. I love that. I love that. Um, let's see. Amber had your hand raised. I think these are in order. Amber, Haley, Rafe, <laughs> and Addie. <laughs> you said it once and it's going to stick with us the whole time. Same, like I forgot those like, it was like as people were talking, I was reminded of things. I know um, it takes us a while to get back through the loop. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm proud of me. I've remembered all three things I've wanted to mention. My brain, my ADHD Good. brain has. Go me. I have to write it down. I have to scribble on a invoice. Um, I cut. What was it? Have, where are my little folded corners? Uh, let's see here. I think one. Oh, I've been scared go. to get out the sticky notes because it gets out of control. So I've avoided, I've been folding, I've been dog earring instead of post-its because it, it gets out of hand. <laughs> I was like, I'm like going back to the scene cleaner. I was like, I did kind of enjoy it. Like she um, included like describing what photojournalists do, being somebody who does that type of work. And I've seen some things like, literally one of my photos right now is being used in a lawsuit against our local police because a kid got his oh. eyes shot out by a pepper ball well i'm glad you were there and i was apparently the only person that got photos of it that thought to take photos of it happening when it happened because it happened so quick but like when it was like when it's like when it says far apart from the ethically shaky world of tabloid newspapers photojournalism serves a vital role in documentary proof where eyesight and testimony are fallible. And then they talk about Margaret Bork White, the first American female war photojournalist and how like she traveled through Germany taking photos. Um, and it says her photos of Nazi atrocities are unflinching important records that she was only able to mentally process later in the dark room. Um, the camera was almost a relief it interposed a slight barrier between myself and the white horror in front of me and for me reading that quote that was like I like five starred that line because like that was kind of why I started doing photojournalism so like for me it's like seeing that I'm like that's very 1000% true because like I used to actively do mostly just protesting and then burnt out and then when I came back I was like okay I have this skill and photo I can use that to help with stuff and kind of and literally would use that almost as like a like she was saying like you know the slight barrier in between the protesting and how it is affecting you mentally like that's literally what kind of what it was for me like I still have and like when she's talking about how like you don't process some of the photos until afterwards it was like I had to go through like, Lord knows, like a good few thousand photographs when I had to send everything over to our lawyers for lawsuits. And like some of the photos, I'm just like, I don't remember that happening. I didn't know I took photos of that. Yeah. Oh, well, and like you're just like, well, then, and then it's like you're sitting there thinking, and you're like, is it just because like there was so much going on that I don't remember? It? Or you're like, is your that brain's my going in like eight <laughs> different directions? <laughs> don't remember um but yeah so seeing her like seeing that like kind of um they talk and then he talks about uh she talks about um kevin carter um who won the pulitzer prize if anybody wants to read more about kevin carter read the bang bang club by greg marinovich it's because it's a talk like, there's also a movie that's based off of kevin carter was a group of these like four um south african men photojournalists who would shoot who were do who documented the um war between the mandela apartheid and it was like between the anc and um the, the zulus when they you had when nelson mandana was freshly out of jail in the early 90s 
Um, and Kevin Carter was one of the main photographers during documenting a lot of that. And the Bang Bang Club is written by Greg Mavernovich and Joao Silva, who are two of the who are two of the surviving like group of dudes and their whole like experience with that. And they talk about Kevin Carter towards the end of the book, they talk about his like his experience with this Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. Um in the movie they show they dramatize it as him he li he's literally like you know giving a speech somewhere about it and they ask him like well do you know what happened to the child and he's just like uh i don't i don't know like and like i don't know and like how and it kind of like talks about how emotionally from like once people started bringing that up how emotionally it and uh, affected him because he was already kind of like the emotional like kind of like very emotionally affected one out of the group and then that happening made it made his emotional mental issues even worse and led to him committing suicide um but yeah so like i saw that i was like oh i'll have to mention that because like i can mention the book um <laughs> um and then like and then also the other parts was like me being like we all know how my feelings about you know mass incarceration and all sure. of that so like, Factoring the guy who does the death masks, one Which is like fascinating, so fascinating. I didn't even realize. Right. First off, I'll say that this is the dude who like plays the harmonica in the band that did the Sopranos theme. What? <laughs> okay, I like how that was just casually thrown in <laughs> as a tidbit. <laughs> um, when he they talk about like I guess it was basically like the dude that um from Texas that like they talk about after he was executed they're like yeah we kind of kidnapped his body and like the, the, um, the quote was like they have him in like the car and they're like on the drive they unzip the body bag so his body could hold his hand the first time he had been touched by friends or family in 12 years of incarceration he oh was still warm and i was like my heart and like also when like they she, she mentioned he met the dude mentions about like, he's like I spoke to him just before he died he's like he was over the moon being like wow you're the guy who's going to do my death mask that's an honor like it's like they usually only reserve that for people like kings I used to think that I was trash but now I know that I'm someone and I'm like my heart death masks are so fr I don't know if you've seen any in person but even like down to the eyelashes, like they are so, I don't want to use the word freaky because I think they're very important, but it is kind of freaky. Like it's just, it's, they're just so still. And, but like just seeing that quote being like, I used to think that these are only done for important people, but I get to have one. <laughs> I feel like, like a person again, because especially yeah. if you're on death row and you're in solitary, you're not going to like that not feeling of being a person feeling definitely is you know heightened and mm -hmm. then they get told this it's like oh okay yeah. it was like going like tying into like the executioner chapter like that's something like for me I've never like kind of thought of and also especially like they talk about the um mental aspect about it like the effect it can have on you as a person like Cause like, you know, from, from me is like, when you kind of, I used to be like, I always think of like executioners for some reason for me, like when I'm a kid, it's like, you know, what was it? You know, like the, like, you know, it's like the big dudes with like those like hoods and the giant, like. It has thing. so many different meanings to it. And so like, in my head, it's like, you know, like it's people who enjoy pulling the switch who want to like kind of kill people. Cause like, you know, because like, I'm very anti-death penalty and like but like reading that like when he's talking about like kind of like his side of things and still like the mental um effect it has on people I was like you never I, I never stopped to think of it that way like that it could be somebody who really didn't want to do the job they just kind of ended up getting stuck with that as their job like because I talk about like how it was like this one dude called out sick because like that it went wrong then like a few weeks before and he didn't maybe he didn't want to do it again and so that's how jerry ended up getting the job just because one dude called out sick 
um there's a couple stories like that too with like family members where like you're kind of born into like a mortuary business which is so fascinating because it's like such a it's such a it's, it seems like such a choice but for some people it's just like the family business there was actually a really good book i read about that that's not nonfiction, but um i can i can recommend it to you at the end of it yes uh, and or when like they mention like um how people like you know used to view executioners yeah right about like how like in france like they had to live on the edge of the towns married within their kind which also was interesting because i'm just like what's that they're <laughs> woman executioners <laughs> explain is that per se like that's not so, like because again like not something you're thinking of you think of an executioner prison like you know prison guard is like is this uh, like a targaryen thing or is this like a <laughs> executioners okay um and like how like they were buried in a completely different section of the cemetery like they had to use long handled things to touch things in the market stalls because like they were gonna pollute the items and and then like when Jerry's talking about like his how he would interact with the people also it's like you never I would never stop to think about those interactions really at the end of at the end of everything like he's like we're like you know he would he would talk about how he would chat with the guys and kind of just like you know like kind of like kind of like not like cheer them up but kind of still just like chat with them about everything and and then, like, you know, and then he goes into, like, you know, the things that kind of changed his view on things, like the, like the, who is it? I think it was the, oh, here it is, like Earl Washington Jr., who had the IQ of a 10 year old, he talks about that got, like, was on death row for 18 years and got, like, exonerated just in time. And then also when he got thrown into jail for something, like, he was talking about that was completely like, uh, he was like this like that was that seemed to be like kind of like out of like he didn't think it was like blah, 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 that he was innocent mm -hmm. and where he goes like uh i think at one point he goes like if they they could convict him of this then they can convict him anyone of anything and like i think for me it was interesting because like when you're reading this like knowing how especially current day viewpoints are on mass incarceration and the death penalty like you're like I feel like it's an un you're not thinking that the executioner is going to be a black man, given the connection to slavery and all of that in regards to that. And like, I think, like, I think I part of me wanted that that's kind of why he was so distant from it, because he it's almost like if you feel like if maybe he lets himself be a little like a lot more open with the part that he plays and what he did all those years it's going to mm -hmm. open up a lot more stuff than maybe he doesn't want to have to come to terms with or discuss or look at his place in everything um but it's like definitely is like looking at it, it was just like and then because again he's especially like when he goes to prison he's like if they could like this thing that's obviously unfounded he's like they could put me in there for anything at this point um bu, 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 what, would I, what did i have mentioned what did i have oh it was i think what was it um death is prom where he's like death is promised to all of us it's guaranteed it's gonna happen the thing is, is we don't have to kill to demonstrate to the world that killing is wrong we know that he now believed that not only was the judicial system unfair and flawed, but that the death penalty was to him pointless. Um, obviously, like I don't also I don't agree with his solution to it, which is just letting them sit in prison for the rest of their lives. I, but like at the same time, like it's interesting to see like he went through all that. And now he's just like he's like it's kind of like you have to think back and realize like your whole life you did this one thing and then you had this one experience and it's just like trying to come to terms with that. You're like, oh. I have to, like I played a part in so many of these different things and now I have to come to terms with it and I think that's that would be kind of why he's kind of distant from it sure. like it was because like you're like being because obviously he has a lot of time to think while being in prison and you're probably just like probably just like I don't want to sit in prison and have to try and come to terms and reckoning with all of this and what I could have done to people's lives and people's families, especially if 
in the off chance one of these people was innocent, sure. that it's easier for me to be like, okay, look, well, well, you know, God put me here. I've meant to do this. This is my calling. It's a lot easier for me to be able to distance myself in that way than to look at any of the other possibilities because that requires me to be got, be a lot more on he might be a lot more honest with himself than he might be prepared to be mentally and emotionally this um, is really random but i just love that ashley reappeared with a child <laughs> surprise sweet baby oh my god so oh, sweet and that's she- mochi and she's grueling and now with the attention she's like see ya <laughs> He's seconds of a test. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> um, Haley, you also had your hand up. Sorry. And then I think oh, Ralph- yeah. yeah. Um, just really quick, I remembered as we were talking, one of the other chapters that was kind of weird to me, interesting, was the I think it was like the cryogenics institute. Um freeze me like talking about how they were freezing the bodies upside down and every day they would come along and like spray the liquid nitrogen and like growing up I had always heard the like rumor of oh Walt Disney like his head is frozen or whatever it is or his body's frozen and so I always thought like that's a sci-fi thing that's not real and then to read that chapter and find out there are literally people paying like thousands of pound thousands of dollars to have their bodies frozen just in the hopes of someday in the future there'll be the technology to reanimate and bring them back to life and reading that I was thinking about it and I'm like would I even want to be like I already (laughs) had my whole life do I really want to have to come back again and deal with all this bullshit again And I don't even know what it's going to look like in however many years, if and when they ever do figure out that technology, like just thinking about it, I'm like, I don't, I don't think I would even want that, even if it could happen or it was a possibility, like everyone I grew up loving and caring about would be gone because most likely the good majority of people are either going to be going cremation burial or whatever most people are not going to be able to afford to freeze themselves so realistically like do I even want to pop back up among all these random people who are going to be like centuries more evolved than me in regards to technology like are they going to sit me in front of a screen and have like here's what happened in the last 20,000 years you were frozen catch up real quick and then <laughs> here you go out into the world. It's like, what, what's so good, that chapter like? <laughs> what's the good in freezing your head? Like, what's that going to do? Is it you just going to put it on display? <laughs> is that somebody's like? Is that just going to be this for somebody? You know, like I don't. I, I, I you know what I didn't know about that actually until I think I left Los Angeles, and it's like a building mm-hmm. in downtown LA, or no, in somewhere yeah. like Wilshire that I drove past mm-hmm. all the time, and somebody was like, "Yeah, by the oh, way." Me as well. Walt Disney's head is in that building and I'm like what the fuck are you talking about that's also Mm -hmm. one of my favorite tropes in sci-fi when like 10,000 people are all frozen and they're put on this ship but only like one person wakes up I'm like oh my god like I love it I love it um I just finished an amazing series that I haven't shut up about velocity weapon where a girl is wakes up out of like a gel bath and she's like missing half of her leg and the AI on the ship tells her it's been like 230 years you've been in this jail bath and it's oh my god I can't shut up about it um that's so fascinating though uh yeah Walt Disney is just going to be somebody's ceramic noggin on a <laughs> cell <laughs> um Hattie hi hello um I wanted to say I started this with the audiobook and I was getting so mad at myself for like having to rewind because I was passively listening to it during work. And then I went out and bought the book so I could annotate everything I loved about it. <laughs> yes, I love that. But yeah, one of the chapters I wanted to touch on a little bit because it was super interesting also was the um 
like the donation of your body to science a little bit because I remember when I was like a preteen I went to the bodies exhibits the museum and it was super cool and I always thought I wanted to do that and um, I liked how she kind of went into the history of how bodies were donated and then also a little bit of the ethics in it um, because it was um the autopsy table that she was talking about where the prisoner essentially his body got donated to science and then they were like filing away layers of his body to create this 3d image um and now he's just there all the time <laughs> as this 3d image body and it was super interesting um for her to kind of get into that a little bit because I was like I don't know if I would be okay with that <laughs> and just existing like that um for everyone to see in the future but um yeah it was super interesting and um yeah everything everyone else said I agree <laughs> I'm so glad I'm so glad there's a general consensus yeah the idea of like donating your body to science is like it sounds so cool but at the same time that just means that like my body parts are just going to be out flailing in the sun for like some science, like these students to just like write about. And I'm like, maybe not. Well, and then she went into the description about how the freezer is just full of people's body parts. Like you're not even a full body for 90% of it. Like, <laughs> and then they put you together at the end when all of your body parts have been wow. dissected, I guess. <laughs> really embracing this meat suit theory. I like it yeah or um yeah fast uh, it's so fascinating I actually did that too there was a body exhibit I think in Charlotte when I was a kid and we went but I wasn't allowed to go into the part about um birth for some reason that was like off limits <laughs> by like the um who was it the Curator. just like the chaperones yeah. just like the people that were there were like if you want to go see the the birthing exhibit uh you have to be with a parent which at that point I already knew I didn't want children so maybe it would have helped and that helped even more um but I remember those were always so creepy because it's just like their nerve endings and like their eyes on like display and it's kind of like <laughs> um I think Ralph you had your hand up too and then Becky was vehemently against being frozen I think that's what she was she was like yeah I I, I I I did I just wanted to say um one of the chapters for me that I I loved was um, uh, I, the Dave and Tony chapter because those guys were just really fascinating to me, you know. Um, and Dave says this thing, you know, oh, because I work here, people ask me if I believe in ghosts. I categorically categorically do not believe in ghosts, but you do see ghosts every day in this place. It's the people who are visiting day after day, and they're alive and kicking but they're so bereaved that all they've got left is coming here and going to the gravestone and standing there. Um, and I've, uh, I have a lot of family. I think we've talked about this before. I have a lot of family members in the, or who have been in the past and some are no longer with us in the death industry, uh, including <laughs> grave diggers, uh, funeral director, people who's uh, one uncle who sold uh, gravestones. And then I had an uncle in Philadelphia that we're pretty sure may Michelle don't listen may or may not have been responsible to sending people uh to their grave uh but uh I mean that he passed away years ago so we don't really know or talk about that um but yeah it's just been kind of interesting growing up in a in a family like that you know I think the first funeral I went to I was only five years old uh so I don't know uh, there you go thank you Michelle we don't prosecute dead folks I love awesome it. Starting it off with Uncle in Philadelphia, I feel like we knew. Yeah, that. that's like, I, all I had to say was that, and all y'all like, oh shit, we're going <laughs> there. Um, and Haley, I'm kind of with you, like in terms of not wanting to be cremated. As far as I'm concerned, death to me is deleting my Facebook and fuck this hell site. That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> you know, I don't want to. I don't want to come back. You know, I'm leaving here for a reason, yeah. and um, we're good. Um, so. You know, I mean, there are is a laundry list of people I would love to haunt if that's possible, but that's that's about it. But no, this was an excellent book. It was outstanding. I, I this and Caitlin's book that we've read, these two have been like the top two for me. Uh, and I did not realize that I had another one of her books on my shelves. She did a book called The Art of Neil Gaiman, which 
I have and didn't even oh, realize right. it was the same author. Uh, so I went back um, when I was rereading this because I'd actually pre-ordered this book and got it when it came out back in, out in September. And because it just sounds so fascinating since I have so many family members in the in the industry, so to speak. So anyway, it was a really great read. And I went back and looked at that Art of Neil Gaiman book again because Neil Gaiman is, you know, he's so great. So, I love, yeah, all. my father is Eddie Campbell, a comic book artist. Yeah, I, so I gotta go look at him up. I mean, <laughs> she's, she comes from a really fun pedigree of humans. And I mean, she wrote about Neil Gaiman and his art and it's a beautiful art book. So if you like Neil Gaiman and you like art, and the writing was really good too. So um, anyway, I love that. Neil Gaiman. I need help um, with Neil Gaiman and starting. We're to start with Neil Gaiman, so we'll talk about that soon. Because we'll chat. We'll chat. I I need a I need a assistance on that. Um, yeah, and I love too the idea. And I read about this. I think I did a TikTok video way back in the day when I still did those um, about the Anatomy Act of what is it eighteen something. Um, I was doing this day in true crime history and that that came up the anatomy act of 1832 which stipulated that surgeons could take the unclaimed dead from prisons poorhouses, asylums and hospitals thereby equating poor with felon which led to a whole other world of social turmoil which i love that but the anatomists got their bodies regarding uh, regardless of the dead's wishes and the poor had some new things to add to their list of fears but the idea that people who were religious didn't like the idea of potentially going to heaven with missing an arm missing a leg cut open missing parts of their body like it was it, it freaks people out because you know there were there were people who um vehemently believed there was dr southwood smith previously written about how burial was a waste of bodies that could be better used in teaching which i agree but then you had like who was it um james the what is it fourth or the sixth i don't know roman numerals i'm an idiot um the edinburgh edinburgh guild of surgeons and barbers could have access to certain executed criminals for dissection england then followed in 1540 when henry the eighth granted anatomists an annual right to the bodies of four hanged felons just one and later six when charles the second a patron of the sciences gave them further gave them a further two <laughs> dissection became recognized by law as punishment added to the array of existing punishments a special fate worse than death to be carried out publicly described as further terror and a peculiar mark of infamy the ultimate punishment in a religions religious society where bodies were supposed to remain whole in preparation for the resurrection which is not even going to heaven i think just when he when sky daddy comes back and everybody is supposed to be in one piece but some are missing a heart or a lung it's, it's, that's just so fascinating to me um and also shameless plug if you have not read anatomy by sarah schwartz yet highly highly recommend the sequel i think is coming out in um february really fascinating somehow ya i don't get that part but somebody in those times that are talking about stuff like this um and there's another book i'll recommend afterwards um becky Do you have to go? Oh, sorry. I'm here. I'm just saying bye to Carrie. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of, even though I just finished it this afternoon, I guess I kind of blocked out the cryonics chapter. And I just, I just found it really interesting that Holly, the, the lady that worked there was like, nope, I'm not going to do this. For the very reasons that you said, Haley, of like, everybody I love will be gone. And like, why would I want to? And it, it makes me think of the movie Vanilla Sky. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm kind of like, well, it's like, I already struggle keeping up with what the heck's happening. You know, the next new thing, like, why would I want to try to suffer through that again? <sighs> or whatever. Um, and then I think that um, you reminded me patches of like this stuff about our, nope, you need to eat. You didn't eat a single bite. Yeah, I ate Sorry, I'm also parenting. Um, that um, like, when does body autonomy begin and end? And do yeah. we still have a right to body autonomy even when we're dead? Um, and yeah, and how felons and, or people who were, you know, executed for crimes or whatever, you know, it was sort of like, 
another like freedom taken away from them of like they don't even get any say nope sit there and eat eat some more even after they're gone they don't have any say of like what happens to their body um it's like what how to um strip someone of their humanity is that they don't even get a say of what happens to them after they pass like so um because I and I think there was a lot of like grave robbing and stuff back in the day to kind of overcome this issue of right like surgeons and doctors and stuff trying to like learn the trade and stuff but um so anyway you're not full sorry I know that's not very gentle parenting of me but okay <laughs> you are fine that's much that's more than my mother would have been so you are good <laughs> Um, there's actually a really fascinating article that, um, released recently. It's, it's somewhat on topic, not really, but somewhat on topic. Um, I'm in Iredell County, North Carolina, and they, um, recently shared something fascinating on Facebook. Um, in case you missed it, the Iredell County Public Library was awarded a $20,000 grant in order to conduct a ground penetrating radar survey of the Green Street Cemetery to verify the number of burials. This grant will help establish Green Street Cemetery as a designated historic site. The cemetery is thought to be the oldest cemetery in Statesville, North Carolina, and the largest in the county for formerly enslaved peoples. The area is in the process of being cleared of the brush, and we are expected to um, do the GPR survey uh, March 28th, contingent on weather. Um, such a fascinating, such a fascinating, uh, I don't even know where Green Street Cemetery is. I don't even, it's so we weird this like published and like there were so many people that were like, I've never even heard of this. So that's, that is happening and that's absolutely fascinating. I wanted to share that because I felt like it was somewhat, somewhat on topic. Um, and then let me see. Sorry, I have so many tabs open. Where's Zoom? Okay, there y'all are. Um, all right, Amber, and then we're gonna wrap up here pretty soon because we did speak for the full hour and 45 minutes, but that's awesome because we were all chatting. Um, and let's leave just like a little bit of time for a palette cleanser. I would love to hear what you guys are reading. Let's do another cat. I was just gonna say, I'm like, I wonder if it's like some of the same people who did like in that book we talked about a few months ago it's like um the one about dozier mm -hmm. school for the boys because i know that they did a lot of ground penetrating radar and it was like a specific team of people that they had like brought in to do it so i wonder if it's the same like from the success that they got from the dozier school and like the publicity that like caused and brought to like you know doing something like that if that's how this library was able to get this grant to do this for this cemetery being like hey like you know this place down in florida they did this exact thing look at what they were able to do and look at how much they were able to uncover and confirm and like bring closure to people why don't we do the same thing here yeah and like yeah. makes me wonder if like you know it's like a sim like the same team that did it down there or if that's how this occurred just because of like the connections of it being ground penetrating radar and then it also being like and then it being a cemetery and wanting to confirm mm -hmm. the amount of burials and then it also being formerly enslaved individuals and it was a similar thing down at Dozier's because they were using it to find the cemetery where all of the um boys who were black that were killed there were buried whereas like they had the confirmed burials for all the white boys they knew like hey this is this this and this and this but like they had swept under the rug and didn't give proper burials to all of the boys who were black and it makes me wonder if it's a similar concept with this cemetery up in green street especially if you're saying nobody knew it existed like obviously like it's not so it's like it has to be like not it was never high publicized like I'm going to assume it's probably a similar condition to yeah. that something that's like, you know, overgrown, not taking care of type of thing if nobody's ever even heard of it. So that's like, I was just saying, you said, I was like, oh, I want it's like the connection in my ADHD, like, you know, yeah. strings of connection. 
my mom said it's near our I mean I've lived here for most of my life and I I mean Statesville is fairly big there's probably over 25,000 people in it it's on this bigger scale of small towns um and she said it's near the YMCA and I know where the YMCA is Hmm. but I have no idea where the cemetery is but it's also it looks like it's very unmarked too um yes it's like those was I'm like there's so many like I can my ADHD brain is making so many like <laughs> parallel connections between the two that that made that's so really I was like ooh I wonder yeah it's ooh, probably ooh, that case yeah I don't, that itch in your brain I'm so nervous to hear how many people are buried in that. it um so yeah if you guys have not read Anatomy this is such a good book and I I kind of there's I mean it gets fairly gruesome because they are talking about anatomy um but it is a ya book so it's a little bit easier to digest but i do kind of wish at some points it was a ya so it could really go there but i think it does a good job i'm um, not sarah schwartz that's a girl i used to work with dana schwartz um dana as i've followed on twitter for a while so yes definitely read that and then there's another book coming out i think next month which i'm weary about or wary about because the ending of this was perfect um and then another one this one is definitely much heavier this is new animal by ella baxter there's a couple different covers for it um this is about a woman who works as the family mortuary business and then somebody in her family dies and she kind of is thrown off for a loop because she's never have had to do like an embalming or take care of somebody in her family and of course there's issues with like the ex-husband and like the family's wishes and unexpected you know death and like having to you know play let's play this song at her funeral no she wouldn't have liked that like you know and back and forth and whatnot and but through it all in her our main character's kind of um endeavor with this she actually decides to go find her actual father in transylvania and then discovers bdsm <laughs> what it's such a good book and it comes full circle i promise there's like a there it's just it has so many meaningful moments in it and the ending of this i won't spoil it but the way it ends is i mean 10 out of 10 perfect um and this you just will not see advertised in many places because it is it's a very morbid book but it is absolutely wonderful this is yeah both of these are fiction i wish i know we don't read but oh my god somebody else loves new animal i'm so glad new animal is wonderful i don't see enough people talking about this this is a uh, two dollar radio in ohio i think is where they're at um but yeah it's very small yep based in columbus um very small uh really great book um highly 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 recommend and i'm so glad that other people have read it um so yeah thank you guys so much um we have just about 10 minutes before nine o'clock i would love to hear kind of what you guys are reading but i did want to throw this out there i'm going to stop the recording here soon next month we are reading dead mountain which i'm so fucking excited about i am like hyper fixated on the diatlov pass but i don't feel like i know enough about it so I'm very excited to read this and it has absolutely wonderful pictures in it. Um, and I do know the audiobook was on sale a little while ago. So I was able to snag that it is an audible original, but anyway, we are reading that next month. And then I'm going to go ahead and show you this really quick. Um, we have a couple of polls open um, for books that we are reading um, in the coming months, but based on where the polls are headed at this moment, this is what our lineup so far looks like. Um, so yeah, Dead Mountain next month, it looks like we are reading about uh, the Black uh, Plague, um, Black Death in March, which is maybe a little too soon to read another book about death, but here we are. Um, I, this was highly requested. And then April for the Daybell trial, I wanted to read one of the couple of books about Daybell that are out. So we the votes have said Doomsday Mother, and then May, Midnight, and Chernobyl, another hyperfixation of mine, which is Chernobyl. Um, there's a couple different books on Chernobyl as well, but this one was voted on the most. Um, so this is what it's looking like so far, and I will share this picture um, kind of uh, once once everything's final. I think F February 1st is the last day to vote in the polls if you guys have not uh, voted already, but most of these are winning by a landslide. So this is what it's looking like. Um, anyway, would love to hear in the last 10 minutes kind of what you guys are reading. Becky, you had your hand raised. Let me get some more light on my face. And then uh, Ralph and Amber and Haley, you guys can hear. Let me, let me stop the recording.